Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome everyone to our service this morning. We uh, remind you, if you're seated on the inside of the aisle, please begin the Know Your Neighbor form, the little black book. If you pass that down and sign it, when it comes back, you'll be able to see who you're seated near and have a chance to greet them a little later. Uh, our friend of the week this week is Marion Call, so I would encourage you in some way to make contact with Marion, either through a card or phone call or a visit or whatever, at least to uh, try to remember her in prayer and uh, trust that you will do that this week. Awana returns tonight at 6 p.m., so we encourage all the families, children that are involved in Awana to know that that starts tonight. Uh, this coming Wednesday, August the 21st, is going to be a special grief share uh, session, and it's especially for those who have lost spouses and so uh, you're encouraged to possibly sign up, or if you can't sign up, at least go ahead and try to be here, but sign up in the Welcome Center. And then the grief sharing uh, will be starting on uh, the regular sessions will be starting on September the 14th, if anyone is interested in signing up for that. Also, uh, many of you know about our ETSs, Equipping the Saints. Those, those are small group sessions that we have a couple, three times a year. Well, we're going to be starting those the first week of October. But the, uh, one of those ETSs is going to be uh, held in the Wings of Grace Sunday School class. And it's uh, on a book about a movie that we're going to go see this week called Overcomer. And I'm saying all of that to invite any of you that may want to go with us. The VIPs are going to be going uh, this Thursday. We're going to meet here at the church at 345 to go see the movie Overcomer. It's at Taze Valley Cinemas. It starts at, uh, well, the, need to be at the theater at 415 if you're not going to ride up with us. But everyone's welcome. But I encourage you to try to see that movie, even if you can't go with us on the, uh, this coming Thursday. It's going to be one of the ETSs, and everyone will be, have the opportunity to sign up for that. Uh, we trust that God will bless you this week. You would be uh, used in whatever way he would use you to share his love. We ask you now to turn your attention to the baptistry area. Hello, my name is Allie Walls. I was in the car with my mom and I asked her if I could be baptized and then she would ask me questions and I answered him. And I was praying for weeks to, for him to forgive me of my sins. Because I want people to know that I believe that Jesus is my savior and that I love him and I believe that he's the one. My favorite Bible story is Jonah and the Whale. I liked it because God saved Jonah from getting killed by the whale. Jonah had to have faith and courage in God. What I like about First Baptist is Wednesday Night Live because you get to learn about Jesus and sing. Well, we're um, honored and privileged to, to baptize Allie today. And um, if you're here with Allie as family to support her, would you just stand so we can greet you and, and she can see you from here? There's family. Thank you guys for being here for this special day with Allie. Let me, let me say also that, you know, some people give different reasons why they've never been baptized. They've come to Christ, they know Jesus as their Savior, but they've never taken that step of obedience and been baptized. And um, sometimes it's out of fear or whatever. Uh, let me tell you what, this, this young lady right here is, is uh, being very courageous today because, uh, you know, she's, she's, uh, she's sometimes quiet. Sometimes she talks a lot, but sometimes she's quiet. And, but um, Allie is pushing all those fears aside because she said she wants people to know 
that she loves Jesus and that he is her savior. That's what you just heard her say that. And so uh, I hope that Allie being up here today will be an encouragement to you. And uh, that you'll tell her that too. And maybe it'll lead you to follow the Lord in that step of obedience. Well, Allie, have you asked Jesus to come into your heart and save you? And you want to serve him? Well, I want to baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised in the newness of life. Good job. My name is Jerry Mullins. I currently serve on the deacon board here. And I'd like to read from uh, Proverbs 3, verse 9. It says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with your first fruits of all your produce. Now, last week, uh, Pastor Jeff uh, gave a sermon uh, about giving. And the takeaway to it was uh, God gives us money so that we can express the profound impact of our grace, of his grace, and invest in its proclamation. Let us pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day, and we thank you for this young person uh, that is giving their life to you. We just praise your name for that, and we ask that you bless the giving of of the money and uh, for, to work in your kingdom and just help us to do what's right and to praise you, Lord. And we ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful song about prayer written by someone we know, Jeff Davenport. Your heart's laid low, there's a place to go, a place where fear is rare. It can't be found just wandering round. You travel there in prayer. I'm on my way through my day. It seems so far from here, but once I go, this truth I know, he'll take away my fear. Jesus will take away my fear. Do you long for peace and hope? Do you even dare? Oh, come with me and find that place, God's peaceful place of prayer.
Let's pray, God. When you hear that, what's in your heart? What makes you? Yes, Jody, thank you. Come on. What a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. Let's sing it.
continue to sing truth, amen? Because God is good. He loves when we express joy to Him, amen? We've had three different Sundays about worship, about engaging in worship and expressing ourselves. Let's sing this truth straight from the Word of God. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness spoke through the shadows of my soul. Do you remember that? The work is finished. The
Lord God. Come on, brother. Father, we, we come to you in prayer and bow our heads and our hearts toward you. Father, we, we need you. As the old hymn says, every hour we need you. And Lord, especially this hour we need you. As we open your word, we need you to illuminate it through your Holy Spirit. We need you to impress it upon our hearts. We need you to help us, a people who live in a culturally charged, politically correct charged culture. You need, we need you, Lord, to show us your word. You need uh, to give us courage, Father, through your Holy Spirit and through your word to stand alone if need be in the face of uh, even criticisms of others who would not stand with your word or would walk away because you haven't, you haven't made them alive spiritually. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here today who is dead in their trespasses and sins, Lord, that you would bring them alive through your Holy Spirit, through the drawing of your Holy Spirit, a work that only you can do. My words cannot do it. Your Holy Spirit can do it. And Father, help us as a church today as we look at a topic that is um, dealing with the leadership model that you have placed in the church and as we prepare as a church to go forward um, uh, with this uh, process. Um, Father, we want to do things decently and in order and we want to do things biblically. So help us, God, we pray. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. I want to invite you to turn your Bibles this morning with me to the book of Titus. Uh, the book of Titus, Titus 1. We'll look at several verses there, but also we'll be in 1 Timothy 3. If you want to maybe mark those two and where you can flip back and forth, we will be looking at both of those. Today we're talking about <clears throat> who should be a shepherd. Before we get into that, I want to remind you again that tonight um, we are starting a WANA. And um, if you have uh, children of Awana ages, I would encourage you to bring them. I'm a product of Awana, and most of the scripture that I have in my memory was learned in Awana programs. And so it's a great, great program. If you have any influence on your children or your grandchildren or, or friends, neighbors, please invite them to come tonight to Awana. Um, also, don't just drop them off. Uh, we're actually doing Bible studies in here. Uh, tonight, I will be dealing with uh, financial freedom, how to have financial freedom, and who, who doesn't want some perspective on money, right? And um, so I would encourage you to come. Also, this Wednesday night, I'm beginning a brand new series called Thriving in Babylon. And it's going to be a verse-by-verse -verse expositional walk through the book of Daniel. And um, if you... Uh, would like to be a part of that, I would encourage you to come. Daniel thrived in a pagan land, and um, it gives us some great principles how we might be able to, to do that as well. Dwight Eisenhower, in his book, At Ease, Stories I Tell to Friends, recalls an encounter that he had with a gentleman, an officer, actually, early in his career, who had been cheating at cards. Eisenhower said, he came into my office, and I laid the pack of cards on the front of the desk. Do you see these cards? Yes. Are they yours? Do you recognize them? He flushed and said, no, he couldn't. Well, I can show you exactly where you've marked them. Would you like me to do that? Well, stammering, he said, no. To end it, he said, I ask, would you rather resign at once for the good of the service or would you like to be tried by court-martial? He said, I'll submit my resignation this afternoon. Well, two days later, the congressman, a congressman showed up in Eisenhower's office with the father of the man. And the congressman explained to Eisenhower that this man that he was with, the father, was one of his uh, most important constituents. And he urged Eisenhower to, res to, to rescind the resignation of the officer and transfer him to another camp. Well, Eisenhower said this about it. He said, I declined politely. This would be passing the problem on to another commander, and the man would repeat the same offense. The man had been guilty of cheating. 
And he had to take this request to the War Department. End of quote. General Eisenhower knew that leadership requires good character. And a man who cheats at cards will be a man who cheats in other areas of his life and is not fit to lead other men into battle. The Apostle Paul under the influence of the Holy Spirit, was tasked by God to correct some leadership problems in the early church, to establish a leadership um, strategy, and in so doing, he established by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Scripture for us a New Testament model of church leadership and oversight. Um, we uh, refer to it as a council of shepherds, and we've adopted that leadership model, a New Testament biblical leadership model here at First Baptist Church. Um, if you would like, I did some extensive teaching on that, and I would encourage you uh, during this process over the next few weeks and months to go back to January the 20th and January the 27th and check out those two sermons that I preached on those topics. You say, I can't get online, whatever. Let us know. We'll get them to you. We'll hand deliver the text to you or whatever we need to do so you can familiarize yourself with that teaching. Because I'm going to say some things today and you might go, whoa, wait, you know, whoa, I didn't know that or whatever. I want to encourage you to go back to that teaching because we set all of those things up extensively in that. So, The shepherds that we are about to call as a church and nominate as a church to consider, to give oversight to our ministry here, need to be men of character. They need to be um, biblically qualified because it's possible for a person to be a really great guy, a really likable person, but not be qualified to be a shepherd of a church. And so we need to get this right. This is a critically important thing because as a church, when we get things right biblically, God will bless our ministry. He will continue to bless our ministry. Now we're going to be primarily in uh, these two passages of scripture, Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3. But before we go there, I want to kind of set up for you where we are in this process, the timeline right now. The deacon board, according to the bylaws, has already convened and established what is called a uh, council of shepherds selection committee. Now, what their job, they're just sitting and waiting right now because what their job is, is once the church nominates potential shepherds, then they will take that list, the nominating committee will hand it over to them, they will take that list and look at it just to make sure everybody on the list meets the biblical qualifications. That's it. Then they will hand that list back to the nominating committee. The nominating committee will then go to those individuals because one of the qualifications, according to 1 Timothy 3.1, is that you need to desire this position. And they'll go to them and say, well, are you willing to serve in this position? If, are you willing to go on the ballot and serve? And so um, uh, then they will present that to the church on a ballot, on a special business meeting on Wednesday, September the 18th. It's a month from now. Wednesday, September the 18th. And you have all that in your bulletin, the timeline, everything. And uh, that's when we will come together and we will vote on that list. Now, um, already there are, we need nine, according to the Constitution and bylaws. We need nine. And I'll say more about the qualifications and everything in a minute. Um, But right now we have three already, three from the pastoral staff, Um, myself, Ron Hayes, and Brian um, Cantrell. Now you say, well, what about Pastor Jerry? Well, we all talked, first of all, the the bylaws state that only 33% of the makeup of the Council of Shepherds can be pastors. And so that meant only three of us could go on there. The senior pastor goes on because he's the senior pastor by fault. I'm on there default-wise. So we talked, and Jerry has just, he, he told us, he said, hey, I just ex- uh, accepted some leadership responsibilities on the state level, and um, for that reason, you know, this first go-round, I'd like to maybe, you know, 
pass that off. And so that's why uh, Jerry is very qualified, and we hope that he'll be on it in uh, future uh, councils as we go forward with this. But that's why that's set up like that. Once the council is selected, then they will assume the biblical oversight of the church. They will not be doing, I'm not going to re-preach the sermon again. Please go back to January 20th and 27th. They will not do the work of the boards and everything else. They are there to just provide biblical oversight for the church according to the New Testament model. So today, our purpose today is to look at God's word and see what those qualifications are. And let me just say also, don't be so quick, please, to to dismiss the calling here. Because you may already have said in your heart, hey, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a shepherd. I don't want to be on that council of shepherds. Well, let me say, let me ask you this question. Has God called you to be on it? Has God potentially spent years developing and protecting your character for a moment just like this? where he is going to call you to provide oversight and leadership for the thing that is most precious to him, his bride, the church. So look at it, pray about it, and see what God leads you to do. So the first thing we see here, and I want to ask you to turn to Titus, is that Christ leads his church through a plurality of spiritually mature men who are called overseers in some cases, some cases they're called elders, some cases they're called shepherds, some cases they're called pastors. When I did the teaching on, in January 20 and 27, we went through all of that. We looked at the, how that interchanges, how those models interchange. These men are officially recognized by the church by virtue of their meeting qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and also Titus 1, and we'll say more about that. And I would also Um, just encourage you to go back and listen to those things again. I can't say that enough. It kind of gives you a a biblical setting and, and moorings for that. But the two lists that are given here in Titus and Timothy are pretty similar when you look at them. And, and except for the command that these Uh, elders or these shepherds need to be able to authoritatively teach and preach the word of God and hold the church accountable to that. That's the one thing. But the one thing that we see here with both of the lists is that it deals with godly character more than even the gifts of the person. It doesn't talk about saying, hey, they need to have you know, biblical ac- or a, a business acumen. They need to be a good business person. Or the, it doesn't go into that. Notice the first qualification it says there. It says they need to be above what? Above what? Above reproach. So that's the first qualification here. They emphasize the man's home life. Now let me say here, I want to I pull off right now for just a moment and please hear what I'm about to say. We live in a very politically charged culture right now. And there's a, there's a temptation for us when we come to church to take the precepts that God's word lays down and hold them up against the political correctness of the day. And say, and, and then we make decisions sometimes based on what the, po- the political environment is, is saying we should do. Especially in areas like this with leadership and when we get into to, uh, certain gender roles and things like that. Listen, we need to be about God's word. God's going to bless his words. He's not going to have us stand before him one day and say, okay, Jeff, um, uh, here's how you, uh, you know, preach that based on uh, the culture that you were in at that time. He's not going to do that. If I hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, if you hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, it will be because we took the unchanging word of the Bible and we applied it to our lives, okay? So I just, I felt like I, I, I need, needed to say that. Now, uh, let's jump into this because we're talking about a spiritually mature person here. And the first thing we see, verse 6, focuses on the person's home life. So it's not even dealing with him at the church. It's dealing with his home life. Look at the first one. Number one, a shepherd must reflect spiritual maturity in his home life. Now, Titus 1, verses 5 and following. Read it with me. This is why I left you in Crete, he says, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders or shepherds or overseers in every town as I directed you. And then in verse 6, he gives the first qualification. If anyone is above reproach. That term there, above reproach, is used to talk about a man's character. 
And interestingly, the, the term above reproach in Titus and above reproach in 1 Timothy are two different Greek words. In, in 1 Timothy, the word is labano, which means to take something away. And in Titus 1.6, it's kaleo, which means to accuse you in court. So basically what this is saying to be above reproach is this person, you can't take anything away from them. You can't look at their life and say, hey, uh, you know, I'm, I could accuse you in court for this. There's no evidence. They live a godly life. They're seeking the Lord. Doesn't mean they're perfect. You know, all perfect people should probably leave right now because this isn't a perfect place and, this, and no leadership position is for perfect people. But if this individual sins, they're quick to confess that sin because they have that relationship with Christ. So under this all-encompassing character requirement, Paul gets into the specifics of the home life. Let's look at them. Verse 6, the next thing he says right after that is a husband of one wife. Now what does that mean? Because it's in both uh, these qualifications here and there have been a number of different interpretations of exactly what this means. So what does it mean? Husband of one wife. Um, Paul is focusing here on a man's present spiritual maturity. Not at the sins that he may have committed in his past. That's not what he's talking about here. You know, every qualification here has to do with the shepherd's current spiritual maturity. For example... What if the man used to be a quick-tempered uh, person who'd shoot off at the mouth and offended people and, and just cursed and did all of these things, but God had since gotten a hold of his heart and, 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 and he, had, he, was, he was walking with Christ, or maybe he had an addiction in the past or something, but God had given him a victory over that. That person is qualified to serve here because he's talking about his current maturity before the Lord, not the past things. And of course, if he's gained victory over those things, currently, that's the important qualifier there. In other words, Paul is more concerned with the present godly character of the person than his past immature behavior. You know, the term literally means a one-woman man. Paul is looking at his character, in other words. He's saying, is this guy devoted to his wife alone if he's married? If he's married, is he devoted to his wife alone? He's not a womanizer. His thought life is under control. He's not enslaved to lust and pornography. God has given him victory over those things. And he's a person with mental and moral purity. Now, a good example of this would be, I mean, you could literally, you could have a person who had been married for 50 years to the same lady, but there was abuse that nobody knew about or the person didn't have victory over their thought life, that person would not be qualified to be a shepherd in the church. And at the same time, you could have a person who had been divorced years before but had looked at his life and confessed any sin in his own life dealing with that divorce and had moved forward and God was using him. There was evidence of God on his life. That person would be qualified to be a shepherd. I believe the text is teaching here. You know, also, this requirement does not bar single, a single man from being a shepherd as long as he's morally pure, including with his thought life. Now, 1 Corinthians 7, 7 says this. He says, you know, Paul was talking about his singleness. You say, you know, you mean a single guy could, could be... Well, Paul was basically a leader. He was an apostle and shepherd in the early church. And he said, I wish that all were as myself, as myself am. What Paul was saying here is, look, I, I'm a single guy. And he goes on to talk about the fact that he could serve God better as a single man than he could if he was married. Now, that doesn't mean if you're married, you can't serve God. But Paul was basically saying here, look, that's not a qualification. If there's a single person who meets all of these other qualifications we're going to be talking about, they could be a shepherd. Singleness does not disqualify them. Now, notice next here that a shepherd must have his children under control. Again, this does not mean a shepherd has to have perfect children or children at all for that matter. But if he does have children, they must be under control, not rebellious. 
Doesn't mean they don't do rebellious things from time to time, but that but there's a correction process there, and they see that as wrong. They don't try and, and, and you know, make excuses for that. In my understanding, our text requires that he needs to have a relationship with his family and his children. Basically, that's what that's saying. He needs to teach them. He needs to pray with them. He needs to put that golly example before them. He needs to discipline where he does, but he always does it under control. Does he pray with them? Because in that case, most of his children are going to grow up and they're going to know the Lord and follow the Lord, although there may be rebellious times in their life. You never know. You know, every one of us is given a free will. You can bring your child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and they can still make certain decisions, but the bottom line is you're looking at this person and you're saying, this guy is committed to raising his children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And he's modeled that. Well, that person could be a a shepherd, but if all or most of his children grow up and they reject Christ, there's probably something wrong in that home. And we should probably not recognize that person as a shepherd. Now, whatever view you take, basically the bottom line, the point that Paul's making here is a shepherd needs to be a godly husband and a godly father. And if his home is not in order, then don't expand his responsibilities over into the family of God. So, number one, a shepherd must reflect spiritual maturity in his home life. Number two, a shepherd must reflect spiritual maturity in his personal character. Verses 7 and following, Paul repeats that general admonition there of above reproach. And then he uses the term as God's steward. As I explained before, the titles of a shepherd, overseer, elder, pastor, those are interchangeable things. Also, a steward talks about one of the responsibilities that this overseer, this shepherd has. An overseer or or a steward was a person who was in charge of the owner's home. In this case, an overseer or a shepherd gives oversight to the church. Who is the owner of the church? Not the pastor, not the shepherd, it's God. In fact, he's talking about the household of God here. And Paul said to Timothy, he said, If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. And so he's talking about overseeing or being a steward of what God has brought into the local church. Shepherds or overseers manage the church by providing oversight. And they do it under the authority of God's word. That's why God sets this biblical teaching principle out as one of the separators between uh, shepherds and deacons and deaconesses. Because, um, and we'll get into that a little bit more in just a moment. But also, as stewards and shepherds, must remember that this is not their church in the sense that they own it. It's the local church. It belongs to God because he purchased it with the blood of his own son, Jesus. And Paul goes on to list five negative character flaws that a shepherd must not have, and then six positive qualities. Now, I want to encourage you, if you have names in mind of people that you say, man, I'd like to nominate this person or that person, as we work through these, I would encourage you to take them on a walk with these qualifications and see how they stack up. And also, let me say this, you know, we look at this, you may say, well, you know, I'm not going to be a shepherd or whatever, so I'm off the hook this morning. No, you're not, because these are basically general qualifications of a mature person in Scripture, except for the the teaching thing and certain things that uh, apply to a deacon. And so these are things that we can all look at and draw from. So let's look at these together. The first are negative ones, five of them. A shepherd must not be self-willed is the first one. Now what that means is he is not self-pleasing. He's not, he's not critical. He, it refers to a man who, is, who stubbornly maintains his own position and rights. He doesn't care about the rights and opinions or feelings of other people. In fact, a lot of times he'll just take the opposite view of whatever you're talking about just so he can assort his, uh, his domination on the, on the subject matter. That person probably shouldn't be on there because it takes a team to do this and, and that person may not be a team player. If he acts in such a self-willed way in the church or with other shepherds, you can also assume that maybe he runs his family like a drill sergeant as well. And um, you shouldn't make that person a shepherd. 
The second one is a shepherd must not be quick-tempered. A quick-tempered man is always a spark away from exploding and blowing up. He uses anger to intimidate and control other people in order to get his way. And by the way, that person is usually violating the first one, which is being a self-willed person as well. James 1.19, listen to what it says, very straightforward. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Patience, kindness, and self-control are fruits of the Spirit, and that should govern a spiritually led man, not a quick temper. Number three, a shepherd must not be addicted to wine. Wine includes all alcoholic beverages, but the Bible, and by the way, I did some teaching on this back at the first of the year, and I said we have got to have some grace in this area, and so I would encourage you to go back and listen to that teaching. We took a biblical position on this. We did come to the conclusion that probably the highest and best choice that the, the Scripture is teaching is abstinence, but we have to have grace in this area. But we're talking about leadership here. And there's a higher standard of leadership placed on these shepherds, these overseers. In fact, it, it, Proverbs 31.4, it says that wine and strong drink is not given to kings. It's not given to those in authority and leadership positions because, you know, we talked about the science of it and everything. I appreciate you go back and, and listen to that because it's a, it's a balanced biblical view on it. We took it from God's word. We're not trying to be culturally correct here. We're trying to say, let's be blip biblical. And so we took that position, but there is an even higher standard placed on church leaders. Church leaders must be especially careful so that they don't cause younger believers to stumble. If a younger believer who formerly had a problem with drinking sees me drinking and my example causes him to fall back into his formal ways, I'm responsible for that. Therefore, a shepherd must be careful and keep this in mind in his position as he's an example to the flock of God. The fourth thing is a shepherd must not be pugnacious. Now that's an unusual word, pugnacious. Pugnacious means that he's physically abusive to others. Uh, but it may in also expand to refer to the person's uh, verbal abuse of others. Uh, he's self-controlled. Uh, even if he has to discipline his children, he does it under control, not to abuse the child. The point is, a shepherd is not a man who solves conflicts by hitting people. That's not how he deals with conflicts. The fifth one, a shepherd must not be enslaved to money. Look at verse 3 of 1 Timothy 3. Paul says he must be free from the love of money. Now we know the, the Bible says that the Bible says this, doesn't it? That money is the root of all evil, doesn't it? Does it say that? It doesn't say that, does it? It says what? The love of money is the root of all evil. So this has to be a person who's free from the love of money because money uh, can do great things. God funds his kingdom. By the way, God gives you uh, a salary. God gives you a means of earning money to feed what's happening in the kingdom, to take the gospel forward. That's our first priority. That's why he says bring the first fruits to the storehouse. But it can also be dangerous. A greedy man is not qualified to be a shepherd because greedy men are not godly men. They will be tempted to take advantage of people. So next, Paul gives some positive characteristics. Let's look at those. Uh, the, ne the first positive one he gives is a shepherd must be hospitable. The word, the Greek word there actually means a lover of strangers. It says that they need to seek to show hospitality. 1 Peter 4, 9 says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. That's something all of us can do. You know, especially if you're in leadership. I mean, if you're talking with somebody in the church and you notice a stranger come in, um, you should uh, stop talking to each other and go and talk to that person and welcome them and say, hey, we're glad you're here. You know, I was, I was talking to someone uh, before the service who actually their child was, um, uh, doing, was involved in, a, in a, like a, a, a ministry internship type thing, a job type thing um, during the summer. And the first place that they went was up north. This was interesting. Went up north, and they said the people were just kind of cold. You know, if you're from up north, I'm sure that's not you. I have made the statement I would probably never hire anybody 
north of the Mason-Dixon line, but uh, just saying. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, th- but then they went down south to, uh, to a southern area and said, the people came up and said, hey, we're glad you're here. And by the way, you say, hey. Okay, everybody say that. Can you say it southern way? Hey. So they were like, hey, we're glad you're here. Come on, girl, let's go in here and get to know you. And, and, and they said it was just totally different. You know, that's hospitality. It doesn't really have to do anything with geographics. It just means you're a hospitable person. You're a friendly person. You're, you're not somebody who's always looking to run away from, from that. So they're, they're hospitable. Um, The next one is a shepherd must love what is good. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is any worthy of praise, listen, think about these things. So a godly shepherd is a person who wants to fill their mind with good things. Not some of the, I mean, there's some of the stuff that's out there today, uh, media-wise and digital and everywhere. I mean, it's, it's not something you want to fill your mind with. The next thing we see is another positive, a shepherd must be sensible. 1 Timothy 3, 2, he, he calls it a sound mind here. It means he's a person that's not, he's not swayed to extremes in his life, but there's a, there's a steadiness there about him. He's not given over to impulse. He's a level, we'd probably call him a level-headed person. The fourth thing is a shepherd must be just. This means he's not partial to you because of the station in life you are. He's not going to look at a a poor person worse than he looks at a a rich person. He's not going to look at a rich person and say, boy, I'm going to be your friend, but it kind of pushes this person off the side. He's not, you know, God is not a respecter of persons in that way. He means he believes in justice and equity and he looks at a situation, he's impartial. He bases it on the evidence of the situation. The fifth thing is a shepherd must be devout. This is talking about practical holiness. He, he, he tries to separate himself from sin. He doesn't separate himself from sinners. You know, Jesus didn't separate himself from sinners, but he tries to lead those sinners to Christ. The next thing we see is a, a shepherd must be self-controlled. That means he has control over things in his heart, in his life, in his mind that would prevent him from going deeper with Christ in the relationship. That's important to him. So, number one, a shepherd must reflect spiritual maturity in the home life. Number two, a shepherd must reflect spiritual maturity in his personal character. And finally, a shepherd must reflect spiritual maturity in his ability to authoritatively teach God's word. You know, perhaps the most noticeable distinction between the, the, the shepherds and the deacons and deaconesses. And when I say deacons and deaconesses, in the New Testament, there's a, there's a, deaconot, a diaconot, we would call. And that's the, the, the deacons, the male deacons and the female deaconesses. The difference between them and, a, uh, and a, an overseer or a shepherd is this mandate that they biblically, authoritatively hold the church accountable to the doctrines of the Bible. Uh, In fact, we see in Scripture that deacons are called to hold to the faith with a clear conscience. But they are never called to teach the faith. They're called to serve. This means deacons do not have the doctrinal oversight role in the church. And accordingly to, to pattern uh, established in, in the pattern established in Acts chapter 6 with the apostles, we see that it is service oriented. Deacons, as we said in our teaching back in January, deacons are the leading servants in the church. And the overseers or shepherds are the servant leaders in the church. God calls them to different tasks in the church. Now, let me say here again that there's a separation in these offices and what they're called to do. There's a cooperation. There's a, uh, the, we complement each other based on how God has called us into certain offices and, certain, and to do certain things. We are not called to be political. So we must adapt to Scripture. And clearly it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 and 14, Paul commands, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority 
Authority is the key word there, over a man. Rather, she's to remain quiet, for Adam is formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Say, what's that all about? Because that's an explosive verse in our politically correct environments that we live in today. What he's saying here is he's saying that in the church, and I'm saying in the church, this doesn't go... This does not pertain outside the church in the business world, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. I'll give you a verse of Scripture to prove that. But what he's saying here is in the church, God has established a complementarian view of things in the church and in the home. In other words, God has created man and woman distinct and different. They're equal. They're equal, but they're given different roles. And the fact here, Paul is talking about the authoritative teaching of God's word in the church, and he's separating those roles out for the shepherd. Now, notice this reference he makes here. As soon as he gives that qualification, the first thing he gives as a reference is creation. He goes all the way back to Genesis 1.1, and, and he says the, uh, the Bible, and he shows that this is a matter of creative order. That God created man and then he created a woman with a specific creative general order. Not that men are better than men. I mean, what this means is men and women, listen to me, here's a definition for you. Men and women are both equal before God. This is what complementarian means. Men and women are both equal before God, but they have different roles in both the marriage and the church that complement each other. Listen, there is, there is no scripture that forbids a woman from always and never teaching a man. Uh, we have ladies that teach in our uh, Sunday school departments and different things and different Bible studies and different things around here. And they're great Bible teachers, but they're not called to be elders or overseers or shepherds in the church. That's the way God has established this. And that's that authoritative doctrinal role there. And again, I want to encourage you. I feel so kind of um, uh, like I'm not I'm not able to get into it as much right now but please go back January 20th and 27th and lead, lead listen to those again you know I'm convinced that a denial or a neglect of these principles will lead to the destructive consequences of a church and have and are leading to destructive consequences to churches and to families and to cultures So please, again, go back and review that teaching. I think it's very helpful for us. And with that said, we have to note here, and as I said before, that these qualifications are meant for the church only, not secular life outside the church. You say, I need a verse for that, Pastor. Well, let me give you one. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. He says, Paul is talking to Timothy about this eldership, about these overseers, and he says this, But in the case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how you ought to conduct, how how one ought to conduct himself, where? In the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of truth. So these gender responsibilities and complementarian roles are not carried over into the secular realm outside the church. It's not because of a patriarchal society at the time of Paul that said these things. These instructions are to the church and they're founded on doctrinal truth of created order. So what does this mean that a shepherd should be apt to teach? Well, simply what it means is being able to publicly explain and apply the scriptures to the entire church. It doesn't necessarily mean that the person is a full-time pastor. It doesn't mean that the person even is gifted in putting and crafting together a, 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 a wonderful sermon of some kind. But what it does mean is that shepherd can take God's word and can stand before the congregation and say, here's a situation we're talking about. Let me tell you and show you from God's word how we should respond to that. You know, because you, you can get advice from anybody, but the shepherd should be able to take God's word and, and expound it to you and say, here are the biblical principles by which we operate. And, and, and they won't, you know, in, our, in most churches and in our church too, we have a senior pastor. You guys call me here to be the senior pastor and I carry the load of the preaching and the pulpit ministry in the church. 
I'm called here to keep, uh, you know, to cast vision and to keep order and doctrine and correct ministry. But I have these guys that come around me. There are no anonymous shepherds. If you become a shepherd, you from time to time will be in a position of standing before the congregation and declaring God's word in a doctrinal, authoritative way. Now, I'll close with this. There has been terrible damage to the church of Jesus Christ because of unqualified people who have been put into leadership. So it's imperative that we, as a church, only put into leadership as our shepherds men who are spiritually mature as seen in their home and in their personal character and with their giftedness with God's word. And to that end... I've summarized it. Look in your bulletin there. There's a folded piece of paper, and um, there's, uh, t- there's like uh, one column from uh, all the scriptures from 1 Timothy 3, and another column, all the scriptures from Titus, and, and then the different qualifications of a shepherd and uh, how those are found in there. I-, I made that so that you could take that with you, and as you consider names uh, of, of people that you think, man, I want to nominate that person, I want to encourage you to take that name on a walk down that list and make sure that they meet those qualifications before you take one of these cards. And these cards, this is how you nominate a person, by the way. And tomorrow, nominations will be open for the next two weeks. And then the next, in a month from now, we'll be voting on this. But you take a card. And by the way, um, you, you need to be a member of the church because that's how it's set up. You need to be a member of the church to nominate somebody. If you're not a member of the church, join the church. Join the church. If you're not a member of a church somewhere else, join the church uh, so that you can serve God with us here in this way. But it, it says nominee's name right here. And uh, you can put multiple names on there. You could write names on the back if you need, if you're doing more than one. Um, and, and so then submitted by your name because you have to be a member. We have to have that in the date. And then you can put it in this envelope right here. And you can put it in one of the boxes, uh, the offering boxes in the back. You can uh, send it to the office. You can take it to the Welcome Center, whatever you want to do uh, to turn that in. But I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider this in this process. And do it as God would, would guide you in prayer and according to Scripture. And I can tell you, God will honor that and he will bless and we will see the church continue to flourish under that biblical scriptural strategy of leadership that was laid out for us. Would you bow in prayer for him with me? I thank you guys before I pray for your attention this morning and for those who are tuning in to us as well. Um, these are not easy sermons to teach and preach, but they're ones that um, we are called to be uh, very straightforward and, and honest about um, so that we can all stand before God. I'm going I'm to hand all you guys over one day to the Lord, and you're going to hand me over to the Lord one day, and we're going to stand before him, and he's going to hold us accountable to his word. And sometimes I know you feel like you're standing alone with God's word, but God's word has power, and it's eternally blessed And I'm telling you, if we follow God's word through these things, he will honor us and bless us as a church and a people. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, that you don't leave us alone to figure all this stuff out. But We can open your word and you can teach us and show us how we need to govern ourselves, oversee our church, serve others, love others. We can see some tremendous biblical character, moral principles in these qualifications that we can kind of hold our life up to and see if there are things that uh, you might convict us about and that we need to change, whether it's from uh, hospitality or or a quick tongue or um, being overly aggressive or any of those things. Help us, God, to look at these characteristics so that people see you in us because, Lord Jesus, you encompassed all of these characteristics. We thank you for the model that you were to us, but more than a model, you were our Savior. And you are our Savior. And I pray that if there's anyone here today who has never trusted you as their Savior, that they would come to you by faith and prayer 
and ask you to forgive their sins, that they would confess to you that they're a sinner and ask you to forgive their sins and to save their soul. And Lord, you've promised that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, whoever will call upon your name, you will in no wise cast them out, that they will be saved. You said if we knock, you'll come in. And so, Father, I pray that all over this room, all over this internet, that people will be knocking today in prayer to you and that they will give their life to you. And, Lord, that you'll be able to lay out things for their life and intimacy like they've never seen before, knowing that you are there with them, that you care for them, that you died for them, and that you're leading them in life. Thank you, Father, for these promises. We ask them in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed in song. If you've been praying about joining the church or being baptized as you saw earlier and you want to come present yourself for that, I'll be up front here. Love to talk to you about that. Also, I'll be out in the Welcome Center afterwards. Love to meet you if you're visiting with us. Lord, I come. I confess bowing Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Amen. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the power of your word, Lord God, for stretching us, for challenging us, Lord God. Examine our hearts, and all week long, Father, let us serve you. Let us seek you. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said as they were leaving, amen.